please welcome Chief Executive Officer of Thrive Market, Nick Green, and from Forbes, Laura Heller. Hi, we're uh, thrilled to be here and standing between all of you in the, the last couple breakout sessions of the day. Um, I'm particularly happy to be working and talking about the grocery market. We haven't seen or heard a lot from that category here this, in the last few days. And Nick, Thrive Market operates in what is a trillion dollar CPG market of consumer packaged goods. Tell us how you fit into that. Well, CPG is a trillion dollar market, as you said. Uh, natural and organic is only about $35 billion. Uh, still a massive opportunity uh, and growing about five times the rate of CPG as a whole. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we are a business that is mission driven first, actually. We see a social problem in getting a greater percentage of CPG to be natural and organic and healthy. Um, but we see a huge market opportunity, obviously, in that growth rate in a very, very large space. And your market opportunity lies in also a unique market, correct? Tell us where your customer base is and what your mission is to serve that base. Well, yeah, you look at a trillion dollars in CPG and only $35 billion in natural organic. Historically, that natural organic market has been on the coast. It's been affluent consumers. It's been in major urban areas. And if you go rewind the clock 10 years or even five years ago, you know, middle class, middle Americans weren't necessarily thinking about how to eat healthier. Uh, or at least in many cases not thinking about the right things. Um, that's really changed um, over the last five years especially. You've got a lot of uh, bloggers, uh, YouTube stars, uh, sort of citizen, citizen journalists of all different uh, uh, backgrounds and experiences that are coming out and talking about health and creating awareness. And you have middle class, middle American families who I think for the first time are starting to want to access a lifestyle that previously has not been accessible. Um, so we think there's a huge opportunity to take that $35 billion up to a bigger portion of the $1 trillion market uh, by making natural organic much more mainstream. Uh, so, you know, interestingly for us, 45% of our membership base is actually in the Midwest and the Southeast. It's not those coastal areas that have traditionally had this lifestyle. It's people that are just accessing it for the first time. So $35 billion market, um, VCs must have been pretty anxious to, to fund your effort. You, you know? would think so. Uh, we, uh, we went out fundraising in early 2014. Uh, we actually got rejected by about 50 VCs. Uh, and I think it speaks to just the you know, his, historical tendency of this, uh, this, uh, this space. Um, you know, natural organic has typically been for affluent consumers. I think most VCs are affluent. They live in places like New York and San Francisco, uh, and they have Whole Foods down the street, uh, and they can certainly afford the bill. Uh, so they didn't necessarily get that opportunity in the middle of the country with middle class consumers that wanted this lifestyle. Um, and I think that's generally a gap in the venture, venture funding uh, community in general. Uh, they solve a lot of problems that are huge for coastal millennials, uh, but don't necessarily apply to the broad swath of American families. So for you, it's both accessibility and affordability. And does education fit into this as well? Yeah, I mean, we see three barriers basically to more people living a healthy, natural, organic lifestyle. One is geography, mm -hmm. right? Still half of American families don't live within driving distance of a health food store, so that's a big one. Um, two is price. The average markup on natural organic uh, produce as well as CPG is anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. Uh, and then the third one is education. So it's, you know, people are taking their, their, uh, uh, their education to their own hands, going on the blogs that I alluded to before. Uh, but there's still a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of people that are pretty intimidated. Um, so our platform, we really try to address all of those, right? We, shift, we ship anywhere in the country so you can get the best products that you find in, in an organic retailer, uh, regardless of where you live. Uh, we use a membership club model, so people pay $60 a year, and that enables us to offer wholesale prices. So the goal is to get the price of the products below conventional equivalents. Um, and then we really imbue it with content. We want to create a community and an experience uh, that allows people to access not just the products, but the lifestyle as a whole. Right. And a lot of the interest is bubbling up organically, to use a pun, um, from, from the users in, in the middle of the country and in, in the southeast, you said, is a, is a primary market. How did these people step up to help with funding when you got turned down? 
in your first round. Yeah, so it was sort of the, the irony of our business that we got rejected by over 50 VCs and out of necessity, we had to go somewhere to raise money. And we ended up raising about eight and a half million dollars from t some of these influencers that I alluded to earlier. Social uh, media influencers. Bloggers, social media, best-selling authors, uh, people who are really content experts in health and wellness, mm -hmm. but many of whom don't necessarily come from a medical or health background, but had you know gone through their own health journeys and then talked about it to audiences in a really authentic way. So these people got the problem them. They understood those barriers I just described. They'd overcome them themselves in many cases, and they had a huge audiences of people who were passionate and listened to them uh, on these topics. So we first fundraised from, the, from this group, uh, and then we actually, for the first six months of the business, uh, used them as our exclusive uh, go-to-market strategy. So we bought no paid media, did no you know, offline print, anything like that, uh, and all we did was just let these people talk to their audiences organically, uh, no pun mm -hmm. intended, and authentically uh, about what Thrive Market does and the opportunity to get healthy. And primarily you had mentioned to me when we spoke earlier that one of these bloggers um, was, was very instrumental in helping raise awareness for Thrive Market. Um, where is she? Yeah, I mean, there were dozens that were, that right. were huge, but one that's just kind of, a, I think, a quintessential example is uh, a blogger uh, whose, whose a pen name is Wellness Mama. So wellnessmama.com gets over 7 million unique visitors to her website every single month. Um, she's a 29-year-old mother of four who mm -hmm. lives in rural Kentucky. Rural Kentucky. So, you know, mentioned this earlier, she is someone who went through this process herself, got healthy herself, has huge audience. And to give you a sense for just how engaged her audience is, uh, we will get more traffic to our site when she posts a blog post about Thrive um, than when we were put on CBS This Morning, for example, or Good Morning America. Wow. Now, you also have um, a sharing component or a social commerce component to your business. Uh, for every membership that somebody buys, you give one. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so you know, our mission is fundamental to what we do. We want to make healthy living affordable and accessible to everyone. Uh, and our view is that that mission is actually synonymous with our business opportunity. Okay. If we can achieve that, if we can make healthy living affordable to everyone, if we can open up the trillion dollar market of CPG to uh, natural and organic, um, we can have a huge business. We can also solve a huge social problem. Uh, you know, type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension, um, you know, the United, the United States in general, and especially some of those markets that I was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, have been afflicted hugely by lifestyle diseases. And a lot of these go back to diet. So, you know, we see that as core to the entire, the entire business. Uh, we also understand that, you know, even though middle class, middle Americans can generally afford a $60 membership, there's still millions of Americans who can't. So for every paid member on the site, what we do is we actually donate a free membership to a low-income family. Um, those low-income families then can come on the site and buy product. Uh, we also enable our paid members to use a donate at checkout feature to actually donate to the shopping budgets of those Gives members. Um, so the Gives members will get not only the free membership, mm -hmm. but also for their first few pur pur uh, purchases to seed the habit money to actually spend on the site. So we've raised about $750,000 uh, just in the last year since that program went, program went live. Uh, and we see donated checkout rates that are about five times what you'd see in a brick and mortar environment. Part of that is that we can optimize the online experience so people will donate more. Uh, but a big part of it is that people view their membership as really a community of shared values. Uh, and they view this as a lifestyle that they want to be part of themselves, but they also want to share. And are there challenges on the, the share side of getting the um the families that you have given the memberships to 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 be more involved and 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 be able to purchase more from the site Absolutely. So, you know, the barriers that I described earlier are sort of amplified for truly low-income families. Um, you know, the cost is a big issue. That's why we do the donated checkout to see their first few purchases. Um, the uh, education is a huge barrier. Uh, we created a lot of content on the site. You know, it does healthy hacks on a budget and short recipe videos and different ways to really make the lifestyle easier. Uh, we also curate the catalog in special ways for our Gives members, where they actually have a staples section that they can go to and find products that you know, aren't as intimidating as kale chips, for example. <laughs> um, but you know, fundamentally, the geography still is a, major, is a major barrier for them, and in some cases, internet access is. So we've now started partnering with nonprofits where we'll actually give away memberships that can be used online, but can also be used to pick up Thrive Market products at a nonprofit. Um, so we're in a pilot phase right now in that program, uh, but we'll be rolling out, we hope, pretty aggressively over the course of the next couple quarters. And price has always been a barrier for, for some of the higher-end natural foods. Um, even 
in big cities uh, for millennials. So and part of that is, is the supply chain, right? And there, there are real barriers to delivering grocery, which is one reason why we haven't seen much of it yet. It's just a very, very small market right now. Um, how are you looking at your supply chain and fulfillment and, and maximizing that? Yeah, so the, the approach that we took was to start by circumscribing the problem, right? Logistics is really tough for grocery. Uh, Amazon, as we all know, has been working on it for years and really only really started to come up to the starting line at a national level uh, recently. Uh, what we said is let's, let's focus on the center of the grocery store, uh, the non-perishable products. So we're not selling things that go in the refrigerator. We're selling all the products that go in your pantry, in your medicine cabinets, you know, on your shelves. Um, and that's a lot of stuff, right? It's half of most people's grocery bill mm -hmm. is uh, things that you don't have to touch and feel to see if they're ripe. They don't spoil when they're shipped. Um, they're basically products that are optimized for e-commerce. Uh, and going back to that CPG market, you've got a trillion dollar market. Less than 5% of that market has actually gone online. But there's absolutely no reason why the entire center of the grocery store shouldn't be online. Um, so we basically circumscribed the problem. The logistics are, relative, are much easier. right? We can use existing shipping channels, shipping through UPS and FedEx and other regional carriers. Um, you know, we can hold more inventory. We do all of our own fulfillment. Um, and because we have a curated catalog of these products, we also don't need as much sophistication uh, and automation in our fulfillment centers. Um, you know, we view ourselves obviously as, like any e-commerce company, we, we have a logistics component. Um, but by simplifying that part of the business, we're able to focus much more on the parts that add the most value directly to our members. And that's the merchandising, the curation, the product discovery, um, some of the features and machine learning that we use to personalize the experience, um, and then all the content, right, that makes it something more than just buying the products, but actually learning about the products, learning how to use them, learning about their supply chains. Um, you know, we, we don't want to out Amazon Amazon. Uh, we're not looking to be a horizontal e-commerce retailer. Uh, we want to really, really create something special for a vertical that people view as a lifestyle. And it's, you can't have a conversation here without talking about Amazon as a competitor or as, as somebody who is spurring innovation forward. Um, you mentioned you don't want to out Amazon Amazon. How will you compete with them as they move very, very quickly in this space? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of exciting things, obviously, that Amazon is, is blazing the trail on and, uh, and, and other horizontal e-commerce retailers that will benefit from that and, and will have to compete against it. Uh, we think that in e-commerce, e a strategy that, that, that can be successful and that we're obviously betting on is to say, let's not compete head-to-head -head with the horizontal e-commerce retailers. Um, these retailers want to be utilities. They want to be able to solve your problems on assortment, on price, and on convenience for as many products as possible. And, you know, it's a race to be the everything store. Um, we have no interest in participating in that race. So, like I said, don't want to out Amazon Amazon. We would rather look at a problem that's very specific, a vertical that's specific, where, uh, where there are things that Amazon and others can't and won't do. Uh, and for us, health and wellness is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, there are, it's not just about getting the products, it's about trust, right? So it's having the right products. People don't necessarily want the biggest selection. They don't want 40 almond butters to choose from. They want to know which one's the best. Um, it's also not a just, you know, uh, uh, sort of overall experience. It's a personalized experience. Different people have different needs. They have different values. So by having a curated catalog in one vertical, we actually are able to tag every product across 140 different metadata categories where people can actually personalize the shopping experience that they want to be paleo, fair trade, and only buy from carbon neutral companies. That's three clicks and the entire catalog filters down. So we've, we've leveraged our focus to create a catalog and then an experience with content and then a community with our social mission that is very, very specific to health and wellness. So that when someone comes on the site and is interested in getting healthy and adopting this lifestyle or even just learning about it, they're going to see something here that resonates with their values and that resonates with their identity. Um, and, you know, it's building a brand. It's building a story. And as I said before, because we're simplifying some of the back end of the business, we're able to really invest in creating an experience that you're not going to find on a site that has 40 million SKUs. Well, one way is differentiation and the differentiation in the product mix. How are you approaching that? So that's a, that's a, a great question. And you know, less than 25% of our catalog is sold on most of these horizontal e-commerce retailers. So part of what we're trying to do is, yes, have the sort of stalwart brands from the natural and organic space, but also really investing younger up and coming brands that are doing really innovative things or on the forefront of health trends. Uh, you know, one of the best selling products on our site is bone broth. Uh, it's actually drinkable bone broth. Not what your grandmother used to make stews, but people are actually sipping bone broth and it has huge health benefits. Um, you know, coconut oil 
oil is having its, its time in the sun right now. Um, and we really want to be on that kind of cutting edge, not too far out, but in that place where people are interested in trying something new. Um, and one of the ways that we've done that is actually starting to launch our own Thrive Market branded products. So we work with amazing brands. Sometimes we even partner with those brands to launch our own products. Um, but in, in many cases, we can't get the cost that we need through a third-party brand to offer pricing that is at or below conventional equivalent products. And because we want to bring those new people into the fold of the market, we have to get that pricing right. So you know, we've launched 100 products in the last year that are Thrive Market branded, where we've gone further up the supply chain. We actually raise the bar on quality uh, and then offer even better pricing. Uh, and you know, that's a way that we can create an experience that you just can't find anywhere else. And in this case, actual products that are only sold on Thrive Market. Well, and that speaks to supply chain and some costs. And as we've heard all week, you know, the, the question of what the current administration and the proposed border tax might do to a variety of different businesses, do you see this impacting yours? Uh, absolutely. You know, we, we source from the places where you're going to find the healthiest and best ingredients. Oftentimes, those are not produced in the United States. You know, if we're sourcing coconut oil, you want to be sourcing that from Indonesia. Uh, we launched a organic, fair trade, single source olive oil that you would pay $40 at it for at a health food retailer uh, for $15. That's sourced from Greece, right? It's, it's from the island of Crete. Uh, so we are importing from all over the, all, all over the world, uh, and that enables us to offer amazing prices on the highest quality products for middle class, middle Americans. So uh, if, if there are protectionist measures put in place, it's going to raise our costs. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult for us to pass on savings to our members. And you know, our model is interesting because we don't actually make money on the products we sell. Uh, the goal is just to break even, uh, but then to, to make our money on the membership fees. Uh, but if we can't deliver the value to our members, our business model doesn't work as well. Uh, and the middle class, middle Americans who want to make the shift in lifestyle but can't afford to pay the premium, I think will end up being the ones that are kind of locked out. So within your customer base, by and large, most of them are people that may, might struggle to, to afford to shop at a Whole Foods if they had access to it. And this would just make that even more. Absolutely. Helpful. I mean, half of the people in this country don't live within driving distance of a health food retailer. So you start with that premise. And then you, start, and then you go to the fact that those that do, you know, only a tiny fraction can afford that 25% plus premium. Uh, groceries are a huge part of most families' budgets. And most families do not have a 25% sort of cushion room to buy organic groceries. So, you know, us getting our supply chain really dialed, uh, being vertically integrated, being able to go international is so important. And, you know, obviously regulation that, that is protectionist would really affect that. And your profitability, we can talk about that. If your goal is to break even, where are you in all this? Well, our, goal is, our, goal is, our goal is to break even on product sales. <laughs> um, you know, our path to profitability, like Amazon Prime, like Costco, like any membership model, uh, is to have high annual renewals that drive membership fees that are not you know, directly offsetting a customer acquisition cost. So um, if we do our job right and create an experience and value to our members, and that value is not just the products, it really is the experience in the community um, to where they're renewing on an annual basis, uh, we can drive to profitability. Um, you know, the interesting thing for us, and kind of a, 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 an interesting irony, is that the more efficiency we're seeing on the customer acquisition side, the harder we push into growth. You know, we grew to over $100 million in, million dollars in sales uh, and only our second year in business. Uh, that involved burning cash, but it was because we were finding real pockets of, of efficiency uh, that, do, that do pay back. Um, if we wanted to pull back on that growth, we can obviously get to profitability faster. So we don't necessarily see a, hey, we want to get profitable by X timeline, here's the line in the sand. We think about uh, you know, what's right for the business given you know, what opportunity and efficiency we're seeing to acquire new customers. So 100 million in sales, you have over 400,000 members, uh, of substantial membership base that is part of your social commerce program. Um, where do you see going from here? We're just going to keep going. I mean, our biggest challenge, honestly, is to really stay focused on driving member value. Um, you know, it's the first out of the first inning of CPG e-commerce. It is the first out of the first inning of the natural organic trend, uh, which is you know, supported by science and is being felt by people in their, in their health outcomes. Um, we really see massive secular tailwinds to where, you know, whether there's competition at some point or not, right now no one's doing exactly what we're doing, but even if there is, we think that the market's going to be a rising tide. And so we're just really focused on, you know, not trying to look at the everything stores out there, 
serving our vertical and creating tremendous value for our members, not just in the products that they can buy, though that's really important, but in the experience they can have on the site. So are you still being funded by bloggers? Uh, we actually are. Yeah, are? We, have, we, have, uh, we have the messiest, I wouldn't say the messiest, we have the biggest cap table of any company <laughs> I know at our stage. Uh, we have over 250 investors, um, and the overwhelming number, uh, portion of our investors have written checks smaller than $50,000. Now, we've now raised over $100 million and brought in institutional capital, so they're not the, the primary investors mm -hmm. by dollar uh, uh, numbers, uh, but, by, uh, but by number of people on the cap table, yeah, most of our, uh, most of our investors are value-aligned influencers who actually go out and produce value for the business. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.